Good morning. As we get settled, our meditation verse for the day is from Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. I'd also like to wish you a happy new year as our first worship of the new year as we come together to celebrate our God. Our call to worship today is also from Psalm 103, verses 20 through 22. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his wor word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. As we bless the Lord with our singing, we're going to sing hymn number 100, Holy, Holy, Holy. It'll be up on the screen also and on the screen at home. Holy, Holy, Holy. Please stand with me as we sing.
Let's pray together. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness extends to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. We take refuge in the shadow of your wings. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. Guard our steps as we enter into our worship here in the house of God. Because to draw near to listen and to obey is better than sacrifice of fools. Help us to not be rash with our mouth, nor let our heart be hasty to utter a word before you. For you are in heaven and we are on earth. Help us understand more of who you are. Help us in our worship of you to seek you in our worship, to honor you with our worship, to not be distracted by our own thoughts about what we want or need, but to be focused on our worship of you with the words of the songs we sing, the scripture we read, the prayers we lift up to you, the teaching from your word and our fellowship of communion. Help us understand what it really means to worship you. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you, you can be seated. We're reading responsively through Psalm 119. Today it's Psalm 119, 33 to, 50, 33 to 56. Let's read responsively. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Turn away the reproach that I dread, for your rules are good. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for my hope is in your rules. I will keep your law continually forever and ever. And I shall walk in a wide place, for I have sought your precepts. I will also speak of your testimonies before kings, and shall not be ashamed. For I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. Remember your word to your servant in which you have made me hope. This is my comfort and my ambition, that your promise gives me life. The insolent utterly deride me, but I do not turn away from your law. When I think of your rules, O Lord, I take comfort from the rule. Hot indignation seizes me because of the wicked who forsake your law. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and keep your law. This blessing has fallen to me, that I have kept your precepts. May we think of God's word that way all the time. Our scripture reading, we're starting the book of John today, and our scripture reading in the New Testament is John, verses 1 through 9. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Let's pray, thanking God for his light that has come into the world and that we are able to bear witness here in this country freely still. 
Let's pray our prayer of thanksgiving and intercession. We do have many things to pray about. Um, Faye is coming home today from the hospital, but she, I think, still needs oxygen. Um, so please be keep her in prayer. Keep Annie and her family uh, and Grace in your prayers. I don't have an update, but I, I know that the, uh, the prognosis is uh, not good. But please be praying for her and for the family. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for all you have done for us. This past year that you brought us through, Lord, with uh, disease, with sickness, with financial uncertainty, with uncertainty about life itself. Lord, thank you that we've been able to turn to you and cast our cares on you and not fear. For you are not a God of fear. Lord, thank you so much for giving us your strength. Lord, be with us this year as we start a new year. Lord, it doesn't really make any difference what year from year to year, but Lord, we know we can trust in you in all you do. Thank you for the financial blessing that you've given this church and those who have given freely through this time, Lord, that you've been able to let us meet our budgetary needs and beyond. Lord, just thank you for that blessing. Lord, thank you for the healing you've brought about in this uh, body, Lord, that we've seen uh, people who've had surgery and recovered well, who have had sickness and recovered, Lord, and there are others who are struggling still. <clears throat> we pray that you will be with them. We pray that you will be with Sharon and Tom and Grace and Delora and Artis and those who are struggling. Be with Terry's sister Dottie and nephew Scott. Be with Rhonda's mother, Dolores, and others, Lord, who are struggling and who are uh, away from family and not able to see family when they're in the hospital or in the assisted living facilities. Give them strength also. Lord, pray that you'll be with those who are serving uh, both here and abroad, serving in the ministries here of our church, Lord, that have been in some ways put on hold. Help us still to be able to be a witness to this community and to those around us, showing our love for each other and for them and witnessing for you. Pray that you'll continue to strengthen the small groups who have not been able to meet but are meeting either online or uh, through direct contact. Lord, just pray that you'll strengthen our people who have not been able to be together. Help us to see needs and be able to meet those needs. Be with those serving abroad. We think of Gary and Anita in, in Belize. Lord, we just thank you for your faithfulness as you build the church there throughout uh, that country. As you have others in the churches there, both at Unity Church and St. Andrew's Church with Pastor Ernest, be with his wife, Lord Carolyn, who with her ongoing health needs. Just pray that you be with those churches and the leadership of those churches. Thank you for lifting up uh, men to serve in leadership um, roles there. Pray that you'll continue to lift them up and strengthen them. Be with Larry and Sandy in Peru, Lord, as Larry has been able to uh, be out in the community and abroad throughout that area of, uh, with the Quechuan people. Pray that you'll continue to give them opportunities even as they uh, uh, we're wor witnessing with a family whose grandmother was dying and Lord who ended up passing but Lord there's been a seed of uh, salvation in that family Rachel will continue to see that grow and, and just bless them in that ministry encourage Larry and Sandy thank you for the good year end of year of Jonathan's school and as their daughters are abroad or, or or in this country, Lord. Pray that you'll give them also the ability to have a time back here in, in the states that has been delayed because of the pandemic. Pray that you be with Sandy, who's had health problems and they're trying to discover what that is. Be with the doctors as they perform the septum biopsy to see if she has inflamed blood vessels, Lord. Just that's coming up this in just about a week or so. Just pray that you'll give them wisdom that they'd be able to uh, relieve her of her pain. Lord, we continue to be with those who are struggling and, and uh, be with Annie and her family. Lord, be with Faye as she's coming home. Lord, be with Ken as he recovers from hip replacement surgery. Thank you for that uh, blessing that that went well. Lord, be with those who are sick and who are not able to be with us, those who are uh, unable to be with us because of risk of the, of the uh, disease that's out there. Pray that you will relieve us from that disease. That, uh, that we would see that eradicated and we would uh, be able to be back together worshiping freely without fear of being uh, brought down with that illness. Lord, thank you so much for all you've done for us. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for us being able to worship here together for being able to uh, remember uh, you with the uh, service of communion today. Lord, be with Dave as he preaches the word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please stand with me as we sing the doxology.
Well, good morning. Continuing in our study of the Gospel of Matthew. And we're in chapter 5. And this morning we come to a passage that I have found difficult to follow and understand. I've read it many times and kind of puzzled about it. Uh, this time I had the opportunity to study it more closely, meditate on it, and and I've concluded that the, the difficulty I had with this passage was due to my failure to pay attention to the context. My problem has not been with what Jesus says about the command, you shall not murder, which is in our text. That seems pretty clear. Anger is often a form of murder, only it is not a, per, a murder that a, a person commits with his hands. It is a murder that a person commits within his heart or her heart. In our anger, we want to hurt the other person. We want the other person to suffer. And when our anger is strong enough, we, we want to kill the, the person, really. Only we don't. <laughs> because it's against the law and we are restrained by the law. Either we would not want to break the law and get caught and face the consequences or we would not want to break the law and face our own sense of, of guilt and shame because it would truly be a terrible thing to do to kill another person. Yet what Jesus makes clear to us is that when we act on that anger or hate in any way, it could be to shout at a person in anger or, or curse a person in anger or insult a person in anger or even to express our anger with the tone of our voice. That action comes from the same source as murder. It comes from a heart that wants to hurt, destroy, and even kill another person. And in God's eyes, that makes our expression of anger a sin worthy of the condemnation of death and hell. This seems clear. What I struggle with is what Jesus says after this. First about coming to God in worship and then about being taken to court by your accuser. The clue to what Jesus is teaching in these two situations comes from what Jesus said earlier in verses 17 through 20. In that passage, Jesus made two points that will shed light on this morning's passage. First, in verse 17, he said that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And, and then, in verse 19, he said this, Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the 
least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was speaking into a situation in which the leaders of God's people had relaxed the commandments of God so much that in many cases they had pretty much abolished them. One glaring example, which we'll come upon later in Matthew, was the command to honor your parents. By their teaching, a man was considered free of the obligation of providing financial support to aging parents if the money that he designated for their support was given as a gift to God instead. That's in Matthew 15, verses 4 through 6. But in the case of God's command against murder, the scribes and the Pharisees were severely relaxing God's command because they taught that if you simply refrain from taking another person's life, that you have fulfilled this command. In our passage this morning, Jesus teaches what we are to understand from God's command against murder in contrast to what the scribes and Pharisees taught. And then he goes on to teach how we are to follow his example by keeping the full intent of God's law in regards to this command. In other words, since the fulfillment of the law is to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves, how are we to express love when it comes to the command, you shall not murder? Finally, Jesus concludes by giving a warning to all, since we all fall so short in fulfilling God's command. So let's, with that introduction, read our scripture for this morning from Matthew 5, verses 26 uh, excuse me, 21 through 26. This is God's word. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser, while you are going with him to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your, your word. and Lord, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Father, for giving and sending your Son and that he reveals to us what it means to fulfill your law and loving you with all heart, mind, soul, and strength and loving our neighbors, ourselves. That Jesus did this, our Lord, for you and for us. Lord, we, we thank you and ask your blessing now as we come to this portion of scripture and and we ask that you would give our hearts and minds understanding that we might grow in the fullness of the stature of Christ being built up in him and that we might love one another and honor you in so doing we ask this in your name Amen. Oh, 
Oh, we, we all struggle with anger, and the Pharisees were no exception. We all struggle with this sin in our families, at work or at school, and in church. And as James explains in James chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, it begins with our passions, particularly our passion to have some recognition, some honor, some respect, and also glory. Our hearts very much want this glory for ourselves. And when we do not get it from others, when we do not get from others what we want and what we think that we deserve, we are hurt and our pride is wounded and we often become angry. Similar passions can, can work in other ways as well. We may want to feel attractive, pretty. We may want to, to be good at something. We, we may want to be famous or to be considered smart and intelligent or to be in a position of, of power and influence. And then when someone says or does something that says to us that we are not that kind of person, the, these frustrated passions and desires that we have. When they're frustrated, it leads to quarrels and fights. And James goes on to say, to murder. Of course, when he speaks of murder, he is speaking of the anger and the hate that this kind of conflict produces. And he's simply applying there in his letter what Jesus says in our text applying it to the situation that he sees among the members of the church. We do commit murder with our hands, uh, excuse me, not with our hands, but we do it with our hearts. In verses 21 through 22, Jesus describes this kind of conflict, how it begins with anger and it leads to conflict expressed by insults, and then finally to casting epithets, which is really a form of a curse. <laughs> to us, calling, calling someone a fool may seem like a, a very mild curse, but it is a curse nonetheless, and it expresses contempt for that person, and contempt is hate. In Matthew, 15 verse 19 Jesus said that out of the heart comes murder When we are faced with the command you shall not murder we who belong to God Are to understand that we should go back to the source of this evil Which is the sin that is found in our heart? And when we begin this examination of our hearts, what James teaches uh, in our letter applies. And we find that it often begins with the passions of our sinful hearts to get what we do not have. And that these passions lead to conflict with others who want the same things. And this conflict leads to hate, and this hate to death. Certainly the death of a relationship. This is the kind of sin and unrighteousness also prohibited by the command. You shall not murder. And if we want to overcome this, this anger and hate, we must, by faith, put to death these passions and desires in the death of Christ. In verses 23 through 24, Jesus teaches us what the righteousness of God requires. And it is not simply the absence of murder or even the absence of anger and hate. It is the love of God applied to this situation. Instead of conflict, we seek peace 
that there might be an abundance of love, that there might be an abundance of life. The righteousness of God assumes that we have no anger and hate in our heart toward our neighbor, our brother. And this is where Jesus begins in verses 23 through 24 where we read, so if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Perhaps Jesus begins with our offering a gift to God in worship because he wants to remind us that the most important way that we can show our love for God is the way we love our brother and sister, the way we love one another. It is what Jesus did. It is what Jesus did when he expressed the love that he had for his father. He loved us by laying down his life on a cross. And when he made that act, this is what he said in the garden as Judas came with the soldiers to take him. He said, not my will, but yours be done. And then he gave up his life as a sacrifice for our sin and for our salvation. We are the ones who had something against God. Our sinful hearts did not want him as our God. And God in Christ sought us out to make peace with us so that we might enjoy a relationship of love and of life with him. And we are to follow his example when we find that there's someone who has something against us. We should be concerned for them because what they hold against us may lead them to anger and hate toward us. For their sake and for the sake of the church, which is the body, for the sake of Christ, we must go to them and be reconciled so that they may have a life of peace and abundance of love and life in a relationship with us and with God. And also, and this is precious to God, and also that the unity of the body would be preserved and promoted. When we read, you shall not murder, this command of God should prompt us to consider how we can love our brother and our sister well. It is not about us. It is about them. This is the true love of God and the true righteousness of God, a love that moved Christ to lay down his life for us when we were his enemies. And if we are honest with ourselves, we must face the truth that we do not have a heart full of this kind of love. And this would explain why Jesus says, Next, and why he speaks of going with your accuser to the judge. That's the picture here. You're going to the judge because your accuser is bringing you to the judge. He's bringing you to court. That's what an accuser does. And while you are going you should think about what will come next. The accuser here is the very command 
that the Pharisees were so confident that they had already fulfilled the command, you shall not murder. <laughs> However, it is not man's understanding of this command that will count in that court. It is God's understanding. Before God, we all fall under the condemnation of the law. Jesus said something similar to what he says here in John chapter 5, verses 45 through 47, when he said to the religious leaders, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words. When Jesus says, truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. He is speaking of the punishment of hell. And he is warning everyone who is trusting in his own or her own righteousness. There is only one way to come to terms with the law of God that accuses us of sin. And it is through Christ and his work on the cross for us. There is only one way to be reconciled to God who in perfect justice would send us to hell to suffer the punishment our sin deserves. And God himself in his love and grace has provided the way. God gave his own son to fulfill the demands of his own justice by dying in our place so that God makes peace with us and might love us and give us eternal life. It's just as 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 19 and 21 says, where we read, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Against them. And for you, our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And then we read just a few verses later, behold, now is the favorable time Behold, now is the day of salvation. This is why Jesus says in verse 25, come to terms quickly with your accuser. Because this day is what the day that is the day you have, and you do not know that you will live to see tomorrow. Call upon Christ now for the forgiveness of sins and for salvation. And you will be saved. And for those who, who know his salvation, in our text, Jesus is giving, is giving you an, an answer to a question that you have probably asked when you have read in John 13, verses 14 through 15, what Jesus said there. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Well, how do we wash the feet of a brother or sister in Christ? Well, if we know there is someone who is offended with us in some way and that, we are, and, that, and that they are struggling with having ill feelings toward us or even anger, we are to go to them in all humility, ready to confess our faults and be reconciled to them. 
This is one way that we can help them and serve them and love them and wash their feet. We love them with the love of Christ. For Christ has loved us and washed us and made peace with us so that he now lives in us. Christ humbled himself so that he might be one with us. Even so, we ought to humble ourselves so that we might be one with one another and one with him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for your love for sinners who, would, who want really in our hearts to have you out of our lives. That's our sin. You sought us first. Made peace at the cross that you might open our eyes and save us from the the doom that we were so rapidly heading toward. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your love and your grace for who you are. And that you want in your love and grace to have us be one with you in, in, in a relationship of, of peace and of love. And you want the same for, for us to have that kind of relationship with one another and with you. If we do not love one another, how can we say that we love you? If we do not love the children of God, how can we say that we love God? This is what you've said. Lord, we, we thank you for your love and grace that changes our hearts and transforms us. Because in ourselves, we, we would never hope to love as you've loved us. But we thank you that Christ can live in us through faith and we can follow your command and go to one another and seek to make peace. We can wash one another's feet. Lord, we ask that you would bless your church and build us up. Make us more like your son. We ask this for his glory and your glory. And we pray it in his name. Amen. At this time, we prepare our hearts for celebrating the, the Lord's Supper with a, a hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Let's stand and, and sing. It's really a prayer as well as a hymn.
seated. You know, it was on the <clears throat> day that, and the night that he was betrayed that Jesus washed the disciples' feet. He said that they didn't, they wouldn't understand what he's doing now, but they would afterwards. We understand. He washes us and makes us holy and clean in his sight that he might be one with us and we might be one with him. And that's what this, the Lord's Supper is about. It's our, about our being one with him. About his sacrifice on the cross being our death and his resurrection being our life. And so we celebrate the Lord's Supper until he comes in the hope and promise, not, not the way the world hopes, but the certain hope that he's coming for us. We read, for as often as you eat th this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Let's uh, go to the Lord in a time of prayer and I invite those who are at home to join us in prayer, a prayer of confession. Let's pray. Lord, you know what's in our hearts. You know the, the, the passions and desires that are often stirred by the sin that dwells in us. For we still have this sin nature, this sin heart that really would, would not want you, your rule to, to, to govern us. Would not want you to, to have all the glory. We want glory for ourselves. We desire our own things. We, we, want, uh, we think of the world as our world, not as your world. We look at other people as living in, you know, inter interacting with, with us in our world, forgetting that we live in your world. Lord, we are so lost without you. We're such sinners without you. And we confess this. We confess that our, we are stirred so easily to conflict and anger. And we come confessing and, and seeking your forgiveness for any time we can th remember doing so recently. And any time we have failed to love as you've loved us. Lord, there are many of those. There are many opportunities you give us to love and we don't listen to the leading of your spirit. And we ask your forgiveness. We thank you. We thank you that if we confess our sins, you are f f righteous and faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And on that promise, we come to your table. Bless the bread we're about to receive, we pray. For we pray in your name. Amen.
on the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus, after he had given thanks, as we have in his name, took the bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So I invite you all now to take your cup and those at home as well to take the bread and let us share it together. When the supper had ended, the Lord Jesus took the cup and gave thanks. Let us give thanks for this cup. Lord, we thank and praise you for the cup that represents and is the new covenant in your blood. We thank you for your life shed on a cross for us as a, a criminal. Lord, we, we see there that we are the criminals and you took our place. We thank and praise you for your, your blood that cleanses us and makes us one with you. And Lord, we thank you for this cup and we ask your blessing as we share in it together. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Now, let us take the cup and drink together. This is the cup of the new covenant, which is shed, in, shed for you for the remission of sins. Mm. Let us pray. Lord, we thank and praise you. Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are a, the God of all creation. You fill the heavens and more. Heaven, the heavens of heavens cannot contain you. And you came and became man for us. And then lived for us and died for us, and rose for us, that we might be forgiven and have life in you. Lord, we praise you. We thank you. And we ask that by your own mercy and love and grace, that we would present ourselves a living sacrifice to you, holy in your sight, through the blood shed on the cross. And that this, this sacrifice of ourselves is only our reasonable service of worship. It's, it's only right. And more than right. Lord, we ask that you would enable us to do this. To live our lives for you and not ourselves. It's only by your power and your spirit only through the cross and resurrection of our Lord, for which we give thanks and praise in his name. Amen. Let's join together in some hymns of praise. And our first one, let's stand and sing. It's come, O come to the altar. Amen.
are made that he won't praise you. the benediction. Now may excuse me. I'm just going to do it. <laughs> well, I don't want to get this wrong. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Even Jesus, our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory and honor and majesty now and forevermore. Amen.